In late September of 2013, a mutated strain of the real-life Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, a variant of the Cordyceps fungus, began to spread in the United States. Medically referred to as the Cordyceps brain infection or CBI, it's a parasitic fungal infection that devastated mankind. The Last of Us and The Last of Us Part 2 show the evolution of the fungus over 25 years since the outbreak and provides answers to important questions like what and how many possible stages and mutations of infections exist? What happened to patient zero? How does immunity work? And how would a cure or vaccine be created? Late September 2013, the Cordyceps brain infection began to spread in the United States, reportedly originating from South American crops. A newspaper article found at the University of Eastern Colorado stated that the World Health Organization estimated a death or infection percentage of 60% globally. According to a medical pamphlet from the Center for Disease Control, CBI is able to transmit and infect a person in two known ways breathing in the spores emitted by the fungus or through contact with bodily fluids of an already infected person. After initial infection, the parasite travels to the host brain over a period of one to two days and the incubation period concludes when the fungus has taken over all major bodily functions of the host. At this point, the host enters stage one, the runner. As a result of mycelium forming inside of the brain tissue, the host brain cells will die. This causes them to lose their higher brain function and with it their humanity, rendering them hyper aggressive and incapable of reason and rational thought. If left undisturbed, runners wander around often in packs or standalone wailing or screaming, almost if they are aware of their infection. However, if they spot an uninfected being, whether it's a human or an animal, it will charge directly at it in an attempt to kill it, eat it and spread its fungus. The danger with runners is often that they travel in numbers. One mistake and you find yourself cornered. In the meantime, the fungus continues to grow and within two weeks the host enters stage two of the infection, the stalker. As a result of the progressive fungal growth, it breaks through the face tissue and starts corrupting the visual cortex, altering its eyesight. Not being able to see, its behavior changes. The stalker, often crawling, will hide from its prey until it's close enough, at which point it will lunge out from its cover and attack. If unsuccessful, it will often retreat back into hiding. Stalkers are very quiet, unable to detect in listen mode. However, their presence is known as they often wail similar to runners. You will encounter these often in small packs inside buildings with plenty of places to hide. As the infection proceeds to grow and it reaches a year, the infection reaches stage 3 the clicker. The long exposure to the fungus results in a flower-like fungal growth protruding from its face. With the visual cortex and the rest of its face being completely corrupted, the clicker is unable to see and has developed a primitive form of echolocation. It produces horrifying clicking and screeching noises to locate sources of sound. The hardened fungal plates covering its face make it not only appear less human but act as a form of armor, immunizing them from instant brain damage. Unlike the runners and stalkers, clickers don't resist the fungus, resulting in more aggressive behavior. When provoked, a clicker will enter a berserk mode, aggressively flailing its arms, heading straight for its prey. It won't flinch when it's shot, unless it's hit by a high-powered round. After a decade of infection, the fungus reaches the fourth stage, the bloater. The progressive fungal growth blows up the body from the inside and covers it in a layer of thick fungal armor plates. 
Because of this, the bloater is able to withstand multiple hits from high-powered rifles, making them extremely tough to eliminate. Since the fungus completely deformed the face and blinded them, their echolocation is less refined than that of clickers. Bloaters are extremely aggressive, often charging at their prey to the point that they will even run through walls to close the distance, or alternatively, throw sacks of mycotoxin at its prey that explode on impact. The best way to engage these giants is to weaken their armor plates with fire and proceed by shooting it with everything you have. Other than the original four stages, other mutations of the fungus have been discovered in Seattle. Named after their shambling gait, shamblers are in the process of evolving into a bloater, but likely heavy exposure to water and floods, like in Seattle, caused the mutation. The mutation resulted in a fungal growth that covers the entire body in spore-like pustule clusters that spray gaseous acid. Their mouths are stuck gaping wide open by the growth, but it hasn't fully covered their eyes and limbs. Rather than biting, the shambler attacks and holds its prey only to burn it with its acid. Nothing is as wretched and vile as the mutation that happened to Asian Zero in Seattle. The sixth variant of the infected is a superorganism called the Rat King. Named after the rare Rat King phenomena that has taken place in the Animal Kingdom where a collection of rats was found whose steels are intertwined and bound together by hair and sticky substances. The Rat King is an abomination that is composed of multiple stalkers, clickers and a bloater connected by fungal growth that has taken over two decades to form. Seemingly it's made up from patient zero and the other people that got infected on outbreak day that were locked in a sealed room. It was so full of spores and bloomed fungal growth that they spread out infected and were merged into each other. Its hulking size and strength allow it to burst through metal doors and concrete walls and rip a human limb from limb easily. Its size and armored plating make it extremely resilient to even high powered rifles, explosions and fire and it will take everything you have to eliminate it. As the Red King is composed of multiple organisms, it's possible for one to detach itself from the body, as could be seen in the Seattle Hospital. In its behavior and size, it was similar to a stalker, but its hardened fungal plates and ability to throw sacks of mycotoxin resemble that of a bloater. These mutations make it hard, although not impossible, to take out. Infected can die at any stage, regardless of its mutation and other than survivors killing it, it's unknown what exactly decides if an infected dies or not. After its death, the fungus continues to grow, consuming the body's mass to form a fruiting body of fungal growth, releasing spores in the hopes of infecting anyone unlucky enough to pass by. As sufficient time passes, the fruiting body becomes a sort of moss that is able to fill entire structures with deadly fungal growth. In the 25 years since the outbreak, there was no hope for a vaccine as nothing seemed to cure or even delay the disease. Every person infected, either through spores or a bite, turned infected. Every person except for Ellie. Although she was bitten, she didn't show any signs of infection other than blisters on the locations of the bite. Once smuggled halfway across the country to the Firefly lab, Jerry Anderson, head surgeon among the Fireflies, recorded his findings on Ellie's immunity. April 28. Marlene was right. The girl's infection is like nothing I've ever seen. The cause of her immunity is uncertain. As we've seen in all past cases, the antigenic titers of the patient's cordyceps remain high in both the serum and the cerebrospinal fluid. Blood cultures taken from the patient rapidly grow cordyceps and fungal media in the lab. However, white blood cell lines, including percentages and absolute counts, are completely normal. There is no elevation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
At an MRI of the brain shows no evidence of fungal growth in the limbic regions, which would normally accompany the prodrome of aggression in infected patients. We must find a way to replicate this state under laboratory conditions. We're about to hit a milestone in human history equal to the discovery of penicillin. After years of wandering in circles, we're about to come home, make a difference, and bring the human race back into control of its own destiny. All of our sacrifices and the hundreds of men and women who've bled for this cause, or worse, will not be in vain. What exactly caused Ellie's immunity is uncertain. Similar to other infected, the fireflies tested the antigenic titers, which is a laboratory test that measures the amount of antibodies in a person's blood, was high in Ellie's blood, a sign of infection. However, contrary to the other infected, Ellie didn't have an elevation in white blood cells, pro-inflammatory cytokines and fungal growth of the fungus in the limbic regions. This means that her body didn't respond to the fungus as a threat and that the fungus itself, for whatever reason, didn't mutate and grow. Although Anderson was certain replicating Ellie's immunity was the key to creating a vaccine, the operation that would cost Ellie's life was in no way a guarantee in creating it. The Cordyceps brain infection truly was the worst pandemic in human history. Its origin and evolution throughout the two and a half decades showed six stages and mutations of the infection, resulting in unique and frightening abominations. The runners, stalkers, clickers, bloaters, shamblers and rat king. Each having its own behavioral and physical traits caused by the passing of time and exposure to its environment makes me wonder, are there other mutations of the Cordyceps brain infection? With humanity settling in larger communities, it seems the world is slowly getting back to the way it was. But without a vaccine, it's hard to imagine it ever will. Are there other people that have shown immunity to the Cordyceps brain infection? And how would a possible cure be manufactured? These questions I'm still left with, but it's interesting to speculate. Whatever the future of this fungus-infested world may bring, I must say that its origins, evolution and anatomy of the fungal disease was perfectly designed. Before ending the video, let me leave you with this question. What do you think about the Shambler, Red King and the changes to the other infected in The Last of Us Part 2? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed or learned something from the video, I encourage you to like the video. If you're interested in similar content, that being game lore, make sure to subscribe or even become a channel member to receive exclusive rewards like unique game collectibles that add to the story and lore, behind the scenes posts and way more. The more likes, subscribers and memberships, the more time I can spend on creating content and creating better quality content. With that, I'm ending the video. Thanks again for watching. It's always good to see your smiling faces and peace out.